Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Dio's Ventures, and today we're going to be carrying on with our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful animals people have been making and compare them to their real-life counterparts and have a look at the diversity of the wonderful world we live in. So yeah, up to part 63, I can't believe we've got so many parts already. Uh, we've been really chugging on from the beginning and I think it's really awesome to get to see all these cool species, some that I've never heard about as well, so it's really awesome to use these as a learning curve. So we're going to be starting off today, we've got by Leaf Nick as a Nicholas line rider and Buff Sue. We're going to be starting with the Red Chinned Panchax, I believe how it's pronounced that. So have a look at these little guys in here, see if we can make sure we can spot them. Quite small, so it might be a bit hard. Oh, oop, I think I spotted them, there we are. Quite a small little fish, as you can see here. So these guys are kind of this elongated species and it has these really cool characteristic of um, this pointed upturned snout is like the free, uh, surface feeding panjack species with these uh, bla uh, dark flat and light brown lips uh, with the flanks being a lighter brown and he gets the kind of name the red chinned or the black lipped panjacks as you can see it's almost like a reddish color around its cheeks and gills here and then you can see its lips are definitely a, a more blackish so that's where it kind of gets their name and you can see they have these fine trend, uh, five transverse bars here. So these kind of like just add to the colorations and all that. With a black uh, marking on the mouth, which gives their name. With some variations because of different races and um, mutations and things that can be quite uh, variable in these species. Um, also in terms of their size and length, they get about 2.8 inches, which is about 7 centimeters long. So not the biggest of fish. And definitely one of the smaller animals we've definitely had here. And these guys are typically found in small creeks and streams in places like Western Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, uh, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana. So these guys are kind of found around that West African area. And they are, uh, as I mentioned, they are kind of live in creeks and streams, so they like the fast flowing slight water. So, um,. A lot of people keep them in aquariums, they're quite a common aquarium fish, so if you guys wanted to keep one in the aquarium, they require a tank that's about 24 inches or 61 centimeters with a volume of uh, 10 to 20 gallons or 38 to 75 uh, liters, so that's sufficient. And they prefer a tank with dark colors and plants along the side and rear, and they leave open areas to so the center of the tank with scattered rocks and rocks for hiding places. And um, they prefer uh, water chemistry of about uh, pH 6 to 7 and they like water between 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. And these guys are active predators and they're peaceful towards fish that are similar sized or larger. But they are territorial, males can be territorial and aggressive during breeding times. And in the wild they'll typically feed on whatever they can like small insects, uh, fish fry, larvae, um, live things, small crustaceans, but in, obviously in captivity you can also feed them flakes. And the main difference as you can see is that the males can be more variable in color and have longer films, uh, fins and particularly larger, but females may lose their striking patterns. And yeah, so a really cool little fish here done by Leaf, Nicholas Linerider and Buff Sue. Uh, cool to see some of these smaller guys. These go well in a small tank and it's cool that we get to see some small fish in this game. Really loving it. So next we're going to be moving on from a uh, really cool little fish uh, to the a critically endangered cichlid. So very interesting guy that we get to talk about here with some conservation. And um, this is the pen, uh, pinstripe darba cichlid or just called the pinstripe darba or the pinstripe mimabello. I believe how you pronounce that. Quite small little fish as you can see here. Wait for one going for a swim. Let's see if you can find one in the water. Oh, there's one in the water. Kind of hard to click sometimes, but look at these wonderful little guys. So these guys are a uh, species of cichlid fish that reach about 12.8 uh, to 25 centimeters or 5 uh, to 9.8 inches. Uh, their body is very laterally compressed, so it's very, very tall as you can see here. And they have this brownish gray body with these uh, yellow darker bands going down. And the fins are like grayish. Uh, and, uh, with a reddish brown tint to them and also crescent shape. Really, really cool little guys here. 
So these guys, in terms of their distribution, they are found in floodplain lakes in the Sofa River, uh, River system in northwestern Madagascar. And they were formerly classed as extinct in the wild, believe it or not, but a remnant population had has recently been found in Lake Tenzi, and the same lake is also populations of the related uh, uh, Kunidi and Lambe and the round heron um, Savangala robustus. So there's a lot of endangered fish that were found in that river system, luckily. And they are technically considered extinct in the wild, or well, were, now they're considered critically endangered. And this is a really great example of how private peoples and zoos can really help a species. Because these guys are uh, threatened in the wild because of overfishing and invasive species from other cichlids. And they are part of a captive breeding program that is uh, kept by public institutions such as the Bolton Museum and London Zoo but also private fish keepers also keep these guys to make sure they're pure and there's a really good example of how hobbyists and uh, zoos can work together to protect species and I think these are really cool little animals here consider critically endangered now these guys were done by Leaf and Buff Zoo so the dream team when it comes to all the fish and now we're going to move on to the large mouth bass so really really cool guy here let's head over here we've got ourselves a large mouth bass <laughs> it's really cool to see these guys. So, largemouth bass uh, are a carnivorous game fish from the sunfish family or Syndicaridae, and they're a species of black bass that is native to east and central United States, southeastern Canada, and northern Mexico, but has been widely introduced elsewhere. And they have all sorts of different names such as the green trout, uh, LBM, uh, northern largemouth, southern largemouth, potter's fish, Florida bass, all these things. And they have this olive green color to them, which is really, really cool, and the greenish gray as well. And they have these dark bands going down, dark line going down their side around their lateral line. And these guys are actually the largest of the uh, black basses, and they reach a maximum length of about 29.5 inches, or about 75 centimeters, and can weigh up to 25 pound one ounces, or 11.4 kilograms. And sexual dimorphism has been found, with females on average being larger than males. And the average lifespan for these guys is about 10 to 16 years. So in terms of the diet, as juveniles, they will feed on small bait fish, water fleas, small shrimp, insects, other smaller vertebrates, things like that. But as they become adults, they'll eat smaller fish such as bluegill, minnows, uh, banded killfish, also worms, uh, cray uh, crayfish, frogs, snakes, salamanders, bats, and even be known to eat small water, water birds, mammals, turtle hatchlings, and alligator hatchlings. So they've got quite a varied diet. And in larger lake systems, uh, they'll often occupy, the adults will often occupy deeper water than uh, young fish. And the shift of diet is basically almost ent entirely to smaller fish like shad, yellow perches, and other these small fish that they can eat. And it's also suggested that studies of these guys show that in weedy waters they tend to grow more slowly because it's more difficult to acquire prey. And this weed cover allows them to easily catch prey and become larger, which is really, really cool. And they're considered generally apex predators in their habitat, though they're preyed on by a lot of other animals when they're young, such as herons, northern pike, muscalunges, channel catfish, uh, kingfishers and bitterns will feed on the bass, also bald eagles, American eels. Uh, younger ones will be preyed upon, though adults tend to be uh, pretty uh, invulnerable to most things. Um, these guys reach sexual maturity and begin spawning at about a year of age. And spawning takes place in the spring season where the temperatures are consistently above 60 degrees or six, uh, 6 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius for a sufficient period. And in the northern regions like Canada, it usually occurs from late April until early June. Uh, in southern states, where the largest and healthiest specimens typically can have it, they can be from March and usually over by June. Uh, they make nests and moving debris from the bottom by using their tails, and the nests are usually twice the length of the males, or this can vary, where they prefer sand, mud, uh, or gravel bottoms, but they also use weedy bottoms to uh, cover their nests, and also use roots and twigs and things. And after finishing, the male swims near the nest looking for a female, and they swim together, nest together, they'll turn their bodies so the eggs and sperm can be released, and laid on and the bait and the bass usually spawn twice per spring and sometimes three to four times if the conditions are favorable um, the male will guard the nest until the eggs hatch which usually takes about two to four days in southern US and Mexico and slightly larger in northern parts of their range and then finally if uh, depending on the water temperature the male will stay with the nest until the infant bass are ready to swim on their own uh, which could be two more weeks after they hatch 
And after this, uh, newborns will switch to more summer roll, and they focus more on feeding. So yeah, really cool little guys here. Let's see if we can find the other ones. What are you doing over here? Where's the other one? We'll have a look at the other one over this one. Beautiful guy. So, angling. They're keenly sought over by a lot of anglers uh, because they have a lot of fight to them. It's fun to fish for them. And um, it's been said that the smallmouth bass, though, is even more aggressive. And they often do bait them, use live baits or jigs, things like that, swim baits as well, and things like that. They typically are managed, of course, because of. Um, Sold cultural, uh, cultural practices suggest that the breed, uh, catch and release, and even the larger specimens, because the larger specimens are usually breeding females that can really help provide the population uh, and help boost the population. And they respond well to catch and release, as they can be loosely hooked and just released back. And given their presence, uh, they're often uh, viewed as an introductory fish because a fish because they're so common. And uh, fishing for largemouth bass helps beginner anglers transition from typical worm and, uh, typical traditional worm and hook to towards a specialist angular fishing with lures and things, at least in America. And sadly, they're kind of considered an invasive species because they are a sport fish and people want to fish them. So it's common to see these guys introduced in other places. They've been introduced into Namibia, I believe. Uh, they're also an invasive species in the Canadian province of New Brunswick. Um, they also have been found in... Uh, they're actually blamed for, the, blamed for the extinction in the Italian grebe, which is a large water bird that was found in Lake Italian in Guatemala. And they've also found them in the Iberian Peninsula, which has been very bad. And also in Japan they've been introduced. So obviously they, even though they're sport fish, uh, they probably shouldn't be there. But um, yeah. These guys were also done by Leaf and Buffsu, really, really wonderful. And uh, Jen, uh, not Jen, Nick also helped with the Pinstripe Circlet as well. But now we're going to move on to the Lemon Shark, also done by Leaf and Buffsu. Make sure everyone gets credited and for their efforts. And look at these wonderful guys here. So this is the Lemon Shark. So uh, these guys are a species of shark that are considered vulnerable and uh, they can grow up to 3.4 meters or about 11 feet in length and they're often found in uh, shallow subtropical waters and have been known to inhabit and return nursery sites for breeding. Uh, they often use electromagnetic uh, receptors to catch their prey as well and they have benefits of living in groups such as courtship, predator behaviors and protection and for mass communication. And um, these guys, typically, as I mentioned, they get about 2.4 to 3.1 meters, or instead of what, 9 to 10 feet, uh, and weigh bit at, uh, up to 90 kilograms, or 200 pounds in adulthood, and are sexually mature at about uh, 7 feet for males, and uh, 7.9 feet for females. And the maximum recorded length was 11.3 feet and 183.7 kilograms, uh, or 11.3 feet and uh, 405 pounds, respectively. And they get this name the lemon shark because they have this like yellowish look to them they look almost like a, a lemon so that's where you kind of get it from they are found typically from new jersey to southern brazil in the tropical west atlantic and they also live with the coast of west africa in the southeastern atlantic in addition they've been found in ba uh, the eastern pacific from the southern baja california to ecuador and they typically live in coral reefs mangroves bays and river mountains and they can be found in open water down to depths of up to 92 meters or 301 feet. Although they do not swim up rivers, they've been seen, uh, they've never been seen really traveling far into fresh water. And they primarily uh, found in open water due to migrations. And they tend to stay along uh, continental and insular shelves for the most of their lives. So we have really wonderful guys here. So let's have a look at you, having a swim. Um, in terms of the habitat selection, as I mentioned, they kind of hang out a lot in these. Uh, coral reefs and shallow waters, things like that, where they can find a lot of prey. Also sandy bottoms as well. And um, these guys typically are mainly piscivorous, so they mainly eat on fish, but they've been known to eat other bicnic organisms and crustaceans and things, and even in certain places they've been known to be cannibalists, so they eat smaller lemon sharks, and even larger, by larger ones have been seen, uh, eating younger ones. 
Um, also, there have been ways that animals try to avoid them for parrotfish. are common in the Bahamas, but they use the camouflage to escape them. But they generally will pretty much eat whatever they can get their mouths around. And interesting, many species of shark have been known to prefer social, uh, known to be social, and live in groups or loose aggregations. And they kind of use this for courtship, uh, predatory behavior and protection. And they tend to like really hang out together. And it's believed to be important for the survival of juvenile sharks, which is very interesting. And they tend to form groups based on similar size. So typically you'll find sharks of a similar size together, since larger ones can eat younger ones. And one example of this boat is shows up to one year old, so no preference for groups of match or match size. Um, they actually have a relative uh, related brain size with complex mammals, uh, social behaviors with mammals and birds. And the brain of the urban shark also being comparable in relative mass uh, to that of a mammal or bird. They have the ability to learn from social interactions, cooperate, and have uh, potentially social bonds and dominance hierarchies. That's very, very cool. So in terms of their reproduction, they tend to congregate in special breeding grounds, or nurseries, I like to call them. And um, females will give birth in these waters, and these babies will be known as pups, and they tend to remain in their nursery area for several years of their lives before they venture out into deeper waters. They are viviparous, which means the mother directly transfers nutrients from her yolk via a yolk sac placenta until the young is born alive. And fertilization is internal and occurs when the male holds the female bites her and inserts his claspers into a cloaca. And female leopard sharps are polyandrous and sperm competition often occurs within her body. And um, these type is kind of called convenience uh, polyandry because females may mate multiple times to avoid harassment from males. And um, they actually breed in a biannual uh, reproductive cycle so that requires a year of gestation and then another year for the uh, kind of recover from it and really get ready to make babies again. So we have one year on, one year off. Um, lemon sharks are reach sexual maturity at about 12 to 16 years old and have low fecundity, so that means they don't breed too often, which is common in these apex predators and ecosystems. And males tend to mature earlier than females, and the maximum number of pups reported in a litter was about 18, so that's pretty interesting. So these guys have a very interesting relationship with humans. The, there have been a lot of studies on them, especially because they are one of the best known sharks um, because of the social behavior and everyone's curious about that. But sadly, they've also been a target of commercial and recreational fishermen across the eastern Pacific Ocean, the Cambrian, and the, uh, not the Cambrian, the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean because of their meat, fins and skin. They're also used for leather and is considered a delicacy in many cultures. And, it's be, and the reason they're put as vulnerable because a lot of these shark populations have, may have been overfished and put in decline. And they actually do not represent uh, a large threat to humans. And there's only been uh, 10 unprovoked shark attacks from these guys and none have been fatal. So you wouldn't have to worry too much about a lemon shark eating it. A really, really wonderful fish. Uh, also done by Leaf and Buffsu. Did a wonderful job. So yeah, now we're going to move on from all our Leaf and Buffsu stuff. But we finally got <laughs> some other things as well. We have got a European Hedgehog by Leaf and Ginger Toast coming back with some really cool animals here. So we got the European Hedgehog. Look how cute you are. So these guys, also known as the West European Hedgehog or the Common Hedgehog, are a hedgehog species that is native to Europe from Iberia to and Italy from northwards to Scandinavia and westward into the British Isles. So they're generally quite um, commonly found across all of Europe and they're quite a well-known species. And um, sadly, they have been put on decline in Great Britain, but overall, their populations are doing quite well. So these guys have a generalist body structure, and they appear brownish, and they have up to 6,000 brown and white spikes on their back, which they use for protection. Uh, the length of the body is about 160 millimeters, or 3.6 inches at weaning, and it increases to about 260 millimeters, or 10 inches, into large adults, where they have a very small, short tail as well. The weight increases from about 120 grams or 4.2 ounces at weaning to 1100 uh, grams or 2.4 pounds of adulthood, so a little over a kilo. The maximum weight is about 2000 grams or 440 pounds, I mean, not 440, 4.4 pounds, though a few wild specimens has been seen to exceed 1600 pounds, even in autumn, so they can get quite big. A couple kilos is quite big for these guys. And um, adult summer weight is typically less in autumn because obviously there's more food around, they get bigger. Uh, and typically in autumn they get about 800 to 500 grams, so they tend to shrink quite a bit, with males being slightly larger than females. Uh, but the size differences of body weights so are sh uh, shadowed by that seasonal variation where they change a lot in weight, which is very interesting. 
So these guys are unlike any creature that lives in its range, and while they exist with the northern white-breasted hedgehog, they're pretty easy to distinguish. And these guys have actually been known to have disease uh, color variations such as blonde hedgehogs, which is a rare recessive gene, and so they're not strictly albino. And they're exceedingly rare, but there are pop places where this population or uh, blonde hedgehogs are more common, such as the Channel Islands of Audrey or North Ronalds Day, where about 25 of the population is thought to be blonde, and true albino morphs are not that common. So in terms of their ecology, they tend to be nocturnal, and they frequently smell and went around, and unlike smaller species, they tend to hibernate during the winter. Um, however, most of the time they uh, wake, they leave once to the nest. Um, so, in terms of their diet, they are pretty generalist. They feed on insects uh, such as earthworms, slugs, beetles, caterpillars, and larvae. Also, which is sadly a thing in New Zealand because they've been introduced, they eat a lot of ground nesting birds' eggs and are thought to be partly uh, due, believed to be um, the reason for decline in a lot of species as well, especially like the rare black stilt because they eat a lot of eggs. And. Um, they also may eat plant matter, but it may just be a natural part of their um, uh, diet. So in terms of breeding, they can tend to breed after hibernation. The pregnancies peak between May and July, but they have been recorded as late as September. The station takes about 31 to 35 days, and the female alone raises a litter, which typically numbers between 4 and 6, although they can range between 2 and 10. Um, studies indicate that litter size may increase in more northern climes, and the young are born blind and a covering of small spines. By the time they are 36 hours old, the second outer coat of spikes begins to sprout, and by 11 days they can fall into a ball and roll into a ball, and it's just pretty cute. And weaning occurs at about 6 weeks of age for these guys. So in terms of longevity, they are, can live up to 10 years old, although their average life expectancy is up to 10 years. Um, big thing is starvation, but they may get eaten by predators, uh, not very often, uh, because they get repelled by the spines, but they can be eaten by badgers, pine martens, red foxes, uh, even roadkill, also golden eagles and owls and um, can kill, but also reduction of rabbits have even caused... Uh, uh, ra uh, hedgehogs become more preferred oh, yeah. prey of huh. eagle owls, especially in Spain oh. because of the uh, rabbit hemophobic disease that spread through and kept murdered like 90% of the rabbit population there. And part of the reason why the Iberian ibex was so endangered. Um, but um, yeah, they are eaten by some things. And as I mentioned, they're endemic to Europe, so they're including uh, European Russia. And they're typically found from west of Central Europe, from southern um, French or Scandinavia, from the Baltic Seas. And they're also present on the uh, Mediterranean islands and the British Isles. And they were also introduced be because when people first started to settle New Zealand, they were mostly British and they wanted to recreate basically UK too. And they introduced a lot of hedgehogs into New Zealand. And, and they've also been introduced into Ireland. Um, Colonials took these New Zealand hedgehogs um, they took them from Europe and Scotland and kind of put them on boats and around the 1860s, the 1890s. And they've now considered, uh, they were originally considered to be agricultural um, pests or to control pests and be pets. But a um, few survived, but they managed to establish themselves around the North Island. They were introduced in the 1890s. And they established in the South Island between 1906 and 1911. And by the time of the 1950s, they're across the old country, though they typically don't live in the higher elevations. And, but a lot of the times, they do not reach the same weight in winter as in New Zealand as colder parts of Europe, since we have milder winters, which means they survive much better in New Zealand, which means they also eat a lot of rare insects, such as wetters. They also eat the mm -hmm. rare lizards. They'll also eat the eggs of brown nesting birds, like I mentioned, the black stilt, which is one of the rarest birds in New Zealand with only 170 alive. And um, yeah, they're kind of on the list of the most invasive species because of that, which really kind of sucks. But um, yeah, still cute little guys. And in uh, terms of protection, they're, hitch they're widely distributed and considered least concern, though there have been some uh, areas where they haven't been doing well. In New Zealand, they've been doing well as I mentioned, and they, I believe they might be trying to include that in that predator-free 2050 banner where they want to get rid of all like cats and rats and stoats and things that um, have been obviously killing all the native animals, which we don't want. 
but in their wild range, um, in Europe in particular, they've been declining. The most recent estimate, uh, estimate of their population is about one and a half million, uh, which has uh, been going down and it's been really established and is now believed to be less than a million hedgehogs in the Great Britain. And uh, their population status has been shown to be declining, so it's very not good. But in terms of their pest status, uh, they've been seen eating uh, the eggs of a lot of uh, introduced, uh, not introduced, uh, native birds in uh, Scotland as well, where they've, and also in New Zealand, because they prey upon like rare snails, rare uh, lizards, rare insects, shorebirds as well. They eat the eggs of shorebirds as well as ground nesting birds, and they like natural predators. But yeah, really, really cool little guys here. It's really cool that we finally get to see more of these guys, some European animals. Uh, really cute guy that will go well in some cute enclosures in your Europe zoos. Uh, again, this was done by uh, Leaf and Ginger Toast. And going on with the theme of Leaf and Ginger Toast and also the theme of Europe, we have got the uh, stoat, or called the short tail weasel, or just the stoat. Uh, New Zealand, we tend to call them stoats here. And these are really cute little guys done by Leaf and Ginger Toast again. So these guys also called stoat, short-tailed uh, weasel, also the ermine. They are native to Eurasia and the northern portions of North America. And because they are widely distributed and they have so many, they are considered least concerned by the IUCN. Um, they are least concerned, really pop, uh, common, and they've also been introduced into New Zealand, as I'll get into. Similar situation to the hedgehog. So um, these guys were common in... Uh, around the mid Pleistocene, that's where they lived in, uh, their ancestor lived in uh, Eastern Europe, in Central Europe as well. And it's believed the long-tailed weasel split about the, um, they thrived after the Ice Age and managed to spread out and they managed to uh, separate from the stoat and long-term weasel, they separated about 500,000 years ago with the Bering Strait. And it suggests that their closest living relative is the American ermine, which is pretty cool. A really cool little guy here. <laughs> really having fun in there. Let's see if we can move you to a, a different one. Let's have you have it around here. So these guys, as I mentioned, they're quite common around North America, Europe, and Asia, and they can be found as far south as Portugal, and uh, they can inhabit most islands, with the exception of Iceland, um, Salzburg, the Mediterranean islands, and some small um, North Atlantic islands. In Japan, they're present in the central mountains in the northern part of Honshu and um, Hokodawa, I believe they're pronounced there. And in North America, they can be found from Alaska to the western Yukon to most of Arctic Canada to Greenland. And though the rest of North America, they can be found in some parts of islands uh, that were replaced by Emrichardi, which I believe is the uh, American ermine, which is a close relative. Um, um, these guys are generally long build. They got this. Uh, they get the name of short-tailed weasel because obviously they have shorter tails, which is a bit hard to show here. Uh, they're pretty general, uh, general in that regard. They're kind of these long, short, uh, long bodies that they use to uh, kind of. They're almost like the mammal version of a snake, where they kind of use it to kind of move through dens or things of smaller um, animals to try and catch them. And um, really, really cool in terms of their size. There's a lot of variation since they kind of. Actually, in contradict, uh, they're not very changed too much in terms of their size due to latitude, which is actually a contradiction of the Bergman's rule. And um, sexual dimorphism is pronounced with about males uh, being 25% larger than the females and twice as heavy, potentially. And, I, and on average, males get between 187 to 325 millimeters, or 7.4 to 12.8 inches, in body length, with females slightly smaller at about 170 to 270 millimeters, or 7 to 10 inches in length. Um, and I believe in their weight, uh, males average about 258 grams or 9.1 ounce, while females usually weigh less than 180 grams or about 6.3 ounces. So in terms of their fur, they have a very dense coat, uh, which is quite close and short, which they keeps them warm, of course, and they usually molt twice a year during the spring and the summer. And I believe some populations don't molt in their southern range. They remains brown, but it become denser in the summer. But in northern parts of their range, they will change into being white, which is really interesting. So in terms of their breeding, they're very, very weird. In their northern hemisphere, they breed from April to July. Though I believe in New Zealand, they probably breed from their summer. So that would probably be around November to uh, January, potentially, or oh, February. Um, 
the male's testes will become enlarged and they actually will kind of hunt around because basically uh, all female, all stoats, they're born pregnant because the male will go find a mother stoat and impregnate her and the babies if he can. And they're usually all in heat for a brief period and can last for an hour. And they're not monogamous, so they kind of... And they usually undergo what's called embryonic diapause. So even though the baby may be pregnant, the uh, embryo inside will kind of stop developing until the mother is ready. And it could lie period uh, lie for a period of about 9 to 10 months. And it can be variable, uh, but typically about 300 days for a stoat. And um, they uh, spend all their lives either pregnant or in heat, which is also very interesting. And males play no part in uh, taking care of the young, and which are born blind, deaf, and toothless, and can uh, covered in these coats of like fine um, coats of pinkish down as well. Their milk teeth erupt after three weeks, and solid food is eaten after four weeks. The eyes open about to five to six weeks of age, and their black tail will appear a week or later after that. And lactation ends after 12 weeks, and prior to this age, kits have poor thermoregulation, so they huddle for warmth mm -hmm. when their mother is absent. And males reach sexual maturity at about 10 to 11 months, while females uh, sexual mature at the age of 2 to 3, uh, when they're still blind, deaf, and hairless, and usually mated by adult males before being weaned. So it's quite weird for a lot of mammals, to be honest. Still really, really cool, guys. Um, they're quite territorial. Uh, they not too different from most things they do. Maintain territories with male temperature, uh, territories being larger, which encompasses also a bunch of females that he can mate with, mm -hmm. and he defends them from other males. It can depend a lot on uh, abundance of food in the season, and um, dominant males can have territories that are quite large compared to younger males, and they mark them with urine, species, and scent marks and all that. So in terms of their diet, yeah, they yeah. feed a lot on uh, a lot of rodent and lagomorph prey, especially large animals. They typically Whoa. eat animals larger than themselves. In Russia, they'll eat water voles, hamsters, uh, peekers, and other things like that. Um, in other places, they'll even eat shrews, small birds, fish, and amphibians, lizards, and insects. And also in Great Britain, they'll eat a lot of rabbits. In New Zealand, they feed primarily on birds, sadly, especially a lot of rare birds such as kiwi, kaka, um, mohau, um, and yellow crowned parakeets, or mohau is also whiteheads, and New Zealand dotterels, which are very rare, um, especially in the South Island. Um, they've also been known to eat young muskrats, which is also very interesting and are opportunistic and are able to kill prey larger than themselves. And they even surplus kill, which makes them extra devastating to uh, New Zealand species because they're very slow breeders. They will, they will pretty much kill uh, because they want to. They, Even though they have enough prey, they'll just kill it because they have that kind of drive, uh, which is sad. But they also usually silent, but they also have chirp. Uh, with their mothers, uh, they with the kits, and adults will typically be a uh, thrill, which is kind of like a whine or a squeak mm -hmm. when they're nervous, or they even hiss as well, and they have all sorts of different behaviors to communicate with each other. And um, yeah, they are doing quite well, but are an invasive species in New Zealand, as I mentioned, they eat a lot of rare birds, and one of the species that have been a focus of the Predator Free 2050, so it includes weasels such as ferrets, rats, and stoats, cats, uh, Possums, animals like that, that really do damage to the native forests and native animals. So yeah, they're great animals, and they're glad they're doing well uh, outside there. Well, not they're doing well, they're doing well outside of New Zealand. They're all common across uh, northern parts of Eurasia and North America. We just don't want them in New Zealand. But still really cute animals. I'm a big fan. So yeah, now we're going to move it on to our third to last animal. So this one was done by Leaf and Monsoon. We have got the Eld's Deer, so really cool animal here, also known as the Brow Antlered Deer. So let's have a look at this wonderful big male to show them off. So the Eld's Deer, they're an endangered species of deer that are endemic to South Asia. They were, um, they typically get about 150 to 180 centimeters long and head to body length, or 59 to 71 inches. Shoulder height 110 to 125 centimeters, 43 to 49 inches. Uh, weight, they typically get between 125 and 175 kilograms, or 236 to 386 pounds, and ant length is about 99 centimeters, or 39 inches. So yeah, really cool deers. Um, these guys generally are medium size in that range, and they are similar in size and shape to the relative, um, the Bashunga. And they're really regal and graceful, and these really interesting uh, antlers, where they get the name the bow, uh, the bow antler deer. The brow ain't the dead because it looks like a kind of a brow there. Really, really interesting. Um, 
Stags are typically taller, or males are typically taller and heavier than the females, which are also called hide and does, with this like a reddish coat. In summer, um, the coats are reddish brown, while in winter they can be quite dark brown. Um, and the short is quite sh um, uh, tail is quite short with no distinctive patch. And despite these features, they're actually related to the Pierre David's deer, which we've covered. Really interesting deer. And the antlers bow or lyre shape does not grow upwards, but it tends to grow outwards and then inwards with a smaller branch growing towards the head, which really gives them a unique look. And I think it looks really, really cool. I hope you not love these deer. So in terms of the conservation status, uh, they used to do quite well in India, of course. Uh, there've been uh, lots of people protecting them. Uh, it's believed to be about 162 deer in uh, a 2000 survey from about about 162 deer that include 54 stags, 26 hinds, and 32 foals, or fawns, I mean. And it seems they may have gone up a little bit uh, in their range. Uh, but in Burma, there's another subspecies, I believe, that's there. They are quite endangered. Uh, other countries, uh, they were hunted for traditional medicine as well, and the demand for captive animals, along with deforestation, has really hindered their numbers. So they're almost as rare as Pere David's deer, and I believe, I'm not sure there's an actual number here, but I believe it's less than a couple thousand of these guys exist at the moment, uh, out in the wild. So, um, yeah, over the past 200 years, they've kind of declined because of uh, hunting and also demand for captive animals, uh, traditional medicine as well, it's really hurt them. Let's have a look at the females while we talk about this <laughs> kind of sad thing. Their breeding and gestation, typically uh, female elves there are found alone or in pairs or with their young. And during the mating season they can gather up to herds of 50 individuals with males rutting and collecting a harem of females for himself. And uh, like other species, they kind of have these spots in here when they're born. These little uh, fawns are born after a long gestation period, so I believe it's about uh, nine months or so. Uh, the young have these white spots at birth, and then they're weaned at several months, about seven months of age, and they become sexual maturity, uh, reach sexual maturity at about 180, uh, not 180, 18 months onwards or something like that. And the gestation period for these three species is between 220 or 240 days, which is quite long, uh, with birth occurring for different subspecies between like uh, October and November and December. The numbers in the wild uh, with the three subspecies, there's believed to be about a uh, few thousand, uh, uh, 180 of the nominate subspecies, 2,200 of the famine, one for Burma and Thailand, the low tens, and potentially extinct in Laos, Kabat, and Vietnam. But luckily, the zoo population is about 180, 1,000, 11,000, and 23 of the three other subspecies. So they're doing okay. They're probably doing. Uh, a little bit better than other species, but they're still really, really cool. And they're sadly, uh, luckily there's good protections in place. They're pretty rare, but um, they could make a good recovery. That's why they're considered endangered. Um, the threats of these guys, as I mentioned, they kind of get hunted a lot for their hides and antlers. Um, Deforestation is a big issue, destroying the habitat poaching. And also loss of genetic variation in their populations is a big issue. But... They seem to be bouncing back. There's uh, lots of protection in the place. They are considered endangered. And um, yeah, they're really, really uh, wonderful deer, I think. Uh, I think they look wonderful. Uh, luckily, that there's still populations of the wild and are back up in captivity. Doing quite well. Uh, at least they've got a good safety net. That's why they're just considered endangered and not really critically endangered. But yeah, really, really cool. And now we're going to be moving on to... We have got the, uh, this was by Leaf and Monsoon, but the next one's done by Leaf and Gaboy. Uh, Gaboy coming back for a really wonderful mod. We have got the Victorian Koala. So we'll get to talk about these guys in the dip depths here. So, um, these guys are kind of the largest koala population. Uh, there's a bit of taxonomic, uh, history with these guys because koalas used to be considered, uh, three different, used to have three different subspecies. And that was believed to be the Queensland Koala, which is the one that more represents the one in-game, which is kind of the smallest. The New South Wales Koala and the Victorian Koala, which was distinguished by kind of their body thickness, their body size and skull shape. With the Queensland Koala being the most northerly subspecies, quote-unquote, or population, these guys were kind of considered the smallest. 
and the Victorian koala being the largest because they have a lot more shaggier brown fur, things like that. But it shows that these guys uh, are not actually that distinct from each other. They just look different. They're not actually different in terms of genetics. So um, they are all considered one kind of uh, evolutionary significant unit, which is kind of a politically correct term of saying they're not. there's no subspecies there because there's not enough genetic variation because there's been limited gene flow and also high amounts of inbreeding and low genetic variation within them. And... Um, and it's been the characteristic of these guys since so like place the scene. Um, also, river, uh, rivers and roads have kind of limited their gene flow somewhat, especially in southern Queensland populations. And um, so we'd all consider these guys, these guys wouldn't be different subspecies. This is just the population that you typically find in Victoria. And the reason is why the Victorian species, uh, not species, uh, population is larger than the Queensland population is because of something, as I kind of mentioned before, is Bergman's rule. So Bergman's rule is kind of a rule that animals, as they get more towards the poles or it gets cooler, uh, they typically get larger because they need to be bigger to conserve heat. So these guys being Victorian, uh, so they live in kind of the southeastern parts of Australia. These guys typically needed to, it's cooler than up in northern Queensland, which is near the equator. So they got larger to be able to conserve heat. And you can see they're kind of much more shaggier. It's still really cool to see them. They're not really too different from other koalas uh, in terms of their um, size. or oh, as size, I've explained the differences. Uh, they tend to be on the larger side, so they could be up to 85 centimeters or 33 inches and up to 15 kilograms. With uh, the southern populations having more of this uh, brownish color to them as well. And kind of other things are considered like uh, they inhabit these eucalyptus woodlands as well, where they eat the leaves of eucalyptus trees. And they actually uh, are largely sedentary. They're kind of like the marsupial sloth. They will often sleep for up to 20 hours a day and they are asocial. So they typically only will be a parent and their kid or just by themselves. And adult males will communicate with these bellows and also use scent glands and things that are located on their chest to be able to communicate with other um, koalas. And they also, uh, being marsupials, they give birth to babies in a pouch. So the babies will stay in their pouch after being born for about five to six, uh, six to seven months of their life. And uh, the young koalas, known as joeys, are fully weaned at about a year old. And they have few natural uh, predators and parasites, but they are threatened by chlamydia. But also the koala retrovirus is another big thing. So you've got to be careful you can get chlamydia off a koala. So it's very careful about that. Um, and because of their distinctive appearance, they've obviously become a great symbol of Australia. And they're also hunted by um, Australians, so Aborigines. And they've been cave art for thousands of years. And just really cool animals here. They're listed as uh, vulnerable species. And they've been particularly badly hurt by the um, fires. Um, that happened around 2020, uh, 2021. Those really bad fires. Um... And they're considered vulnerable because of that, and especially things like uh, habitat destruction, droughts, and climate change. Uh, with uh, obviously climate change making these bushfires more extreme has really been hurting them. Urbanisation, and um, they were actually listed as endangered officially in the Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales, and Queensland. So there have been some concerns a lot about the koalas living around there. But yeah, really, really wonderful guys. Let me have a look at the baby. Look at the little baby koala. How cute. Little baby koala, how cute. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's our koala done. That was done by Leaf and Good Boy. And last but most certainly not least, we have got the common wombat by Leaf, Nick as in Nicholas Line Rider, and Good Boy. So these guys, as you see, based off the koala. The, uh, the common wombat, also known as the coarsehead wombat or the bear nose wombat, these guys are one of the three living species of wombat and the only one in the genus. Bombatus. So these guys, as their name implies, are the most common species of wombat. Um, they get pretty big. They can grow to an average of 98 centimeters long or 39 inches. And uh, 98, I mean, uh, 38 inches and weigh about 26 kilograms or about 57 pounds. So these guys are kind of these three subspecies, quote unquote, um, with one extinct one that was found on the uh, island of... Uh, the night island along with the extinct species or subspecies of uh, emu 
but these guys are typically found there, found across pretty much most of southeastern Australia. They can be found in Tasmania as well. And um, they can get quite big and sturdy. When fully grown, they can reach between 80 and 130 centimeters long and weigh between 17 and 40 kilograms. And they're found on Tasmania and fine as island, but they're often smaller than their mainland counterparts. And you can tell them from uh, both hairy nose and wombat species because of their bare nose, as you can see here. Um, these guys are widespread in these cooler areas uh, of eastern Australia, including Tasmania, Queensland, Western Victoria, and South Australia. And they can be found in any elevation, uh, but they're typically north of the range. They can be found in higher, more mountainous areas. They also live in rainforests, woodlands, grasslands, and coastal areas. And in terms of their behavior, they tend to be solitary and they're quite territorial, with each wombat establishing about an uh, established range where they kind of live and feed. And in this area, they will also dig around and um, dig a tunnel system. These tunnels will range from 2 to 20 meters in length, along with these many different size tunnels that they can climb through. And usually only one entrance to this burrow exists, so they may create a smaller one in which to escape. And the recent uh, bushfires actually showed that these burrows uh, are frequented much lower, uh, uh, frequently showed that burrows are frequently much lower than thought, with some entrances having over 20 entrances, uh, some burrows having up to over 20 entrances. And um, many wombats will use these burrows. Uh, wombat burrows are used by other species, such as wallabies, as shelter from bushfire, a lot of other species. So it's believed that a lot of individual animals may have been saved from by these uh, wombats digging their burrows in the bushfires. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, in terms of their diet, they are typically herbivores. They feed on grass, tussocks, and other materials. And they typically graze during the night. And um, they actually are the only marsupial that has the teeth that continuously grow. So they're able to maintain the diet of kind of native grasses, which can be quite tough. So they have ever-growing teeth to compete with that. And many wombats will actually live in the same burrow, and they'll normally live in the same burrow for their whole life, unless they're forced out of their burrow by farmers or other animals, or if their burrow is destroyed. Uh, in terms of breeding, they breed every two years, and they produce a single joey. And they have a gestation period about 20 to 30 days. And we'll have a look at these little babies as we talk about them. Let's see if we can find one. Look at, let's see if we can find a juvenile. Here's a juvenile. Look at how cute you are. So these guys are typically um, remain in their pouch for about five months. And when they leave the pouch, they weigh between 35 and 65 kilograms. Uh, no, uh, 3.5 to 6.5 kilograms or 7.7 .7 to 14.3 pounds and about 12 to 15 months in age they're typically uh, weaned and they're usually independent about 18 months of age and in the wild they typically have a lifespan about 10 to 15 years and in captivity they can live up to 20 years and one a couple of interesting facts is that because they burrow um, their pouch is actually faced kind of outward like that so often you can see pictures of a uh, mama wombat with the joey's head sticking out like out of a pouch here as she burrows it's so uh unlike other most people that typically have it on their tummy there because obviously if you're borrowing you don't want to fling dirt and stuff into your pouch and uh <laughs> cover all your baby and all the dirt so it typically faces backwards and also they're one of the few uh one of the few animals that have square poops so their poops uh, come out in perfect squares which is kind of sad that you didn't see in the mod but I think it's really, really cool. And even though we've talked about poops, a uh, great uh, way to end on this. Really cool to see all these wonderful animals here. Um, I really enjoyed this episode. I like talking about wombats and koalas and Alds deer and uh, all these guys. Uh, good job to everyone. Uh, Leaf, Nick, Jen, Buffsu, uh, uh, Ginger Toast, and Monsoon, Gaboy. You've all done a wonderful job with all the mods you've done today. So I think this would be a great place to end the video. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye